one particular incident began with a stagecoach robbery and murder. Arizona Weekly Citizen, March 20th, 1881. The robbers fired into the stage and the driver, Bud Philpot, was killed and one passenger mortally wounded. The stage was going up a small incline when a man stepped out on each side of the road and called hold. At the same instant, one fired, then the man on the other side of the road fired. The Wells Fargo shotgun messenger on board the stagecoach, Bob Hall, shouted, I don't halt for nobody, and fired his shotgun toward the voices. The driver fell forward and down between the wheelers, supposed to be killed. The horses jumped into a dead run on the first fire. The reins falling from the driver's hands, they ran nearly a mile before they could be stopped. This saved the stage from robbery and saved Wells Fargo and company treasure. Paul brought the stage onto Benson with the wounded man, who has since died. It is not known yet whether the robbers are shot. Detective Paul has returned to the scene of the robbery. There were eight or nine passengers on the stage, but none others injured. Wyatt and Virgil Earp, along with the stagecoach detective Paul and Sheriff Johnny Behan, led the posse that chased after the outlaws. But they were unsuccessful in tracking them down. Wyatt then tried a different strategy as he testified later. As a detective, I helped trace the matter up and I was satisfied that three men named Billy Leonard, Harry Head, and James Crane were in that robbery. I knew that Leonard, Head, and Crane were friends and associates of the Clantons and McClurys and often stopped at their ranches. It was generally understood among officers and those who have information about criminals that Ike Clanton was sort of a chief among the cowboys, that the Clantons and McClory's were cattle thieves and generally in the secret of the stage robbery, and that the Clanton and McClory ranches were meeting places and places of shelter for the gang. I had an ambition to be sheriff of this county at the next election, and I thought it would be a great help to me with the people and businessmen if I could capture the men who killed Philpot. There were rewards offered of about $1,200 each for the capture of the robbers. Altogether, there was about $3,600 offered for their capture. I thought this sum might tempt Ike Clanton and Frank McClary to give away Leonard, Head, and Crane so I went to Ike Clanton, Frank McClary, and Joe Hill when they came to town. I had an interview with them in the backyard of the Oriental Saloon. I told them I wanted the glory of capturing Leonard, Head, and Crane, and if I could do it, it would help me make the race for sheriff at the next election. I told them if they would put me on the track of Leonard, Head, and Crane and tell me where those men were hid, I would give them all the reward and would never let anyone know where I got the information. Ike Clanton said he would like to see them captured. He said that Leonard claimed a ranch that he claimed and that if he could get him out of the way, he would have no opposition in regard to the ranch. Clanton said that Leonard, Head, and Crane would make a fight, that they would never be taken alive, and that I must find out if the reward would be paid for the capture of the robbers dead or alive. Wyatt contacted the Wells Fargo agent in Tombstone, Marshall Williams, who was able to verify that the reward would be paid dead or alive. It was then agreed between us that they were to have all the $3,600 reward and that Joe Hill should go and lure them in near Frank and Tom McClary's ranch near Soldier's Holes, 30 miles from here, and I would be on hand with a posse and capture them. Ike Clanton then sent Joe Hill to bring them in. He was gone about 10 days and returned with the word that he got there a day too late. That Leonard and Harry Head had been killed the day before we got there by horse thieves. I learned afterward that the thieves had been killed subsequently by members of the Clanton and McClary gang. After that, Ike Clanton and Frank McClary claimed that I had given them away to Marshall, Williams, and Doc Holliday, 
and when they came in town, they shunned us, and Morgan, Virgil, Earp, Doc Holliday, and myself began to hear their threats against us. Wyatt believed that this incident, and Ike Clanton's fear that Wyatt would reveal to the cowboys that Ike had squealed on some of their number, ramped up the tension between the Clantons and McLaurys on one side, and the Earps and Doc Holliday on the other. Doc Holliday was an unusual character, and it is hard to separate truth from legend in his story. There was something very peculiar about Doc. He was gentlemanly, a good dentist, a friendly man, and yet outside of us boys, I don't think he had a friend in the territory. Tales were told that he had murdered men in different parts of the country, that he had robbed and committed all manner of crimes. And yet when persons were asked how they knew it, they could only admit that it was hearsay and that nothing of the kind could really be traced up to Doc's account. He was a slender, sickly fellow, but whenever a stage was robbed or a row started and help was needed, Doc was one of the first to saddle his horse and report for duty. In fact, Doc Holliday, despite suffering from tuberculosis, was part of the posse that spent weeks in the field hunting Bud Philpott's killers. But Holliday also had a fiery temper and was a heavy drinker. If Ike believed that Wyatt had told Holliday about Ike making a deal to sell out fellow cowboys, he would have been understandably nervous about the truth escaping Doc's lips. Ike Clanton met me at the Alhambra Saloon and told me I had told Holiday about this transaction concerning the capture of Head, Leonard, and Crane. I told him I had never told Holiday anything. I told him when Holiday came up from Tucson, I would prove it. On the night of the 25th of October, Holiday met Ike Clanton in the Alhambra Saloon and asked him about it. Clanton denied it. They quarreled for three or four minutes. Holiday told Clanton he was a damned liar. I was sitting eating lunch at the lunch counter. Morgan Earp was standing at the Alhambra bar talking with the bartender. I called him over to where I was sitting, knowing that he was an officer, and told him that Holiday and Clanton were quarreling in the lunchroom and for him to go in and stop it. He climbed over the lunchroom counter from the Alhambra bar and went into the room, took Holiday by the arm and led him into the street. I Clanton in a few seconds followed them out. I got through eating and walked out of the bar. As I stopped at the door of the bar, they were still quarreling. Just then, Virgil Earp came up and told them Holiday and Clanton, if they didn't stop their quarreling, he would have to arrest them. They all separated at that time. Morgan going down the street to the Oriental Saloon, Ike going across the street to the Grand Hotel. But Ike wasn't quite willing to let the issue drop. I walked in the Eagle Brewery where I had a faro game which I had not closed. I stayed in there for a few minutes and walked out to the street and there met Ike Clanton. He asked me if I would take a walk with him, that he wanted to talk to me. I told him I would if he did not go too far as I was waiting for my game in the brewery to close and I would have to take care of the money. He told me when Holiday approached him in the Alhambra that he wasn't fixed just right. By fixed, Ike meant armed. He said that in the morning he would have man for man, that this fighting talk had been going on for a long time, and he guessed it was about time to fetch it to a close. I told him I would not fight no one if I could get away from it because there was no money in it. He walked off and left me saying, I will be ready for you in the morning. I walked over to the Oriental. He followed me in and took a drink. Having his six-shooter in plain sight, he says, You must not think I won't be after you all in the morning. He said he would like to make a fight with Holiday now. I told him Holiday did not want to fight, but only to satisfy him that this talk had not been made. About that time, the man that is dealing my game closed it and brought the money to me. I locked it in the safe and started home. 
I met Holiday on the street between the Oriental and Alhambra. Myself and Holiday walked down Allen Street, he going to his room and I to my house, going to bed. But though Wyatt may have been done for the night, Ike was not. He continued drinking and storming all night and into the dawn. On the morning of the 26th, somewhere about six or seven o'clock, I started to go home and Ike Clanton stopped me and wanted to know if I would carry a message from him to Doc Holliday. I asked him what it was. He said, the damned son of a bitch has got to fight. I said, Ike, I am an officer and I don't want to hear you talking that way at all. I am going down home now to go to bed. I don't want you to raise any disturbance while I am in bed. I started to go home and when I got 10 feet from him, he said, you won't carry the message? I said, no, of course I won't. I made four or five steps more. He said, you may have to fight before you know it. I made no reply to him and went home and went to bed. I don't know how long I had been in bed. It must have been between 9 and 10 o'clock when one of the policemen came and told me to get up as there was liable to be hell. I got up the next day, October 26th, about noon. Before I got up, Ned Boyle came to me and told me that he met Ike Clanton on Allen Street near the telegraph office, that Ike was armed, that he said, as soon as those damned erps make their appearance on the street today, the ball will open. We are here to make a fight. We are looking for the sons of bitches. I laid in bed some little time after that and got up and went down to the Oriental Saloon. Harry Jones came to me after I got up and said, What does all this mean? I asked him what he meant. He says, Ike Clanton is hunting you boys with a Winchester rifle and six-shooter. I said, I will go down and find him and see what he wants. I went out and on the corner of Fifth and Allen I met Virgil. He told me how he heard Ike Clanton was hunting us. I went down Allen Street and Virgil went down Fifth Street and then Fremont Street. Virgil found Ike Clanton on Fourth Street near Fremont Street in the mouth of an alleyway. I walked up to him and said, I hear you were hunting for some of us. I was coming down 4th Street at the time. Ike Clanton then threw his Winchester rifle around toward Virgil. Virgil grabbed it and hit Ike Clanton with his six-shooter and knocked him down. Clanton had his rifle and his six-shooter was in his pants. By that time, I came up. Virgil and Morgan took his rifle on the six-shooter and took them to the Grand Hotel after examination, and I took Ike Clanton before Justice Wallace. After I went into Wallace's court and sat down on a bench, Ike Clanton looked over to me and said, I will get even with all of you for this. If I had a six-shooter now, I would make a fight with all of you. The Earp's patience was wearing thin. Morgan then said to him, If you want to make a fight right bad, I will give you this one, the same time offering Ike Clanton his own six-shooter. Ike Clanton started to get up and take it when Campbell, the deputy sheriff, pushed him back in his seat, saying he would not allow any fuss. I was tired of being threatened by Ike Clanton and his gang and believed from what he said to me and others and from their movements that they intended to assassinate me the first chance they had, and I thought that if I had to fight for my life with them, I had better make them face me in an open fight. So I said to Ike Clanton, who was then sitting about eight feet away from me, You damn dirty cow thief. You have been threatening our lives, and I know it. I think I would be justified in shooting you down any place I should meet you. But if you are anxious to make a fight, I will go anywhere on earth to make a fight with you, even over to the San Simeon, among your crowd. He replied, I will see you after I get through here. I only want four feet of ground to fight Tensions off. had risen higher than ever, and they were about to spread to other members of the cowboy gang. I walked out, and then just outside of the courtroom near the justice's office, I met Tom McClary. He came up to me and said to me, 
If you want to make a fight, I will make a fight with you anywhere. I supposed at the time that he had heard what had just transpired between Ike Clanton and myself. I knew of his having threatened me, and I felt just as I did about Ike Clanton, and if the fight had to come, I had better have it come when I had an even show to defend myself. So I said to him, All right, make a fight right here and at the same time slapped him in the face with my left hand and drew my pistol with my right. He had a pistol in plain sight on his right hip in his pants, but made no move to draw it. I said to him, Jerk your gun and use it. Although Wyatt insisted that Tom McClory was wearing a pistol, at least one other witness reported that McClory was unarmed. He made no reply, and I hit him on the head with my six-shooter and walked away, down to Hanford's corner. I went into Hanford's and got a cigar and came out and stood by the door. Pretty soon after, I saw Tom McClary, Frank McClary, and William Clanton pass me and went down 4th Street to the gunsmith shop. I followed them to see what they were going to do. When I got there, Frank McClory's horse was standing on the sidewalk with his head in the door of the gun shop. I took the horse by the bit as I was deputy city marshal and commenced to back him off the sidewalk. Tom and Frank and Billy Clanton came to the door. Billy Clanton laid his hand on his six-shooter. Frank McClory took hold of the horse's bridle and I said, you will have to get this horse off the sidewalk. He backed him off into the street. Ike Clanton came up about this time and they all walked into the gun shop. I saw them in the gun shop changing cartridges into their belts. Within just a few hours time, Virgil and Wyatt Earp had buffaloed both Ike Clanton and Tom McClory, cracking them across the skull with their heavy pistols. While this treatment might seem rough, Earp historian Alfred E. Turner notes that the experience demonstrates that Wyatt and Virgil did not kill when alternatives such as buffaloing could be successful. Given a chance, Wyatt and Virgil would have arrested and not killed the Clantons and McClory's. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.